Okay, still dealing with this first verse of chapter 14. Look and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And uh, dealing with this, we're looking at the various symbols connected with with this uh, event, and uh, some of the explanations of these symbols. I think we were we down to about paragraph six or seven. Six. We start six. Yeah. Okay. So paragraph five, just to just get the summary on that, to connect, is talking about the fact that Zion and Jerusalem figure largely in the divine purpose, and and they mark the location of the revealing of the hundred and forty-four thousand multitudinous Christ to the world. So Christ and the saints will be manifested to the world enthroned in that location in, in Zion and in Jerusalem. It's kind of the, the uh, summary of that last paragraph. Paragraph 6 talks about this place of Zion and Jerusalem in the divine purpose. It's kind of continuing the, the discourse on that. He says, But the time approaches when in a literal or unfigurative sense our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. This standing was represented to John in the standing of the Lamb and the 144,000 on Mount Zion, where are then set thrones of judgment, the throne of the house of David. And he quotes from Psalm 122, verses 2 to 5 in support of that. As our feet shall stand within thy gates of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord, for there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. So these thrones of the house of David belong to Zion and nowhere else. They do not belong to to the seven mountains, or Rome, but to the holy hill of Zion, which the Father styles his, in Psalm 2, verse 6. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Um, pardon me, verse 6 is what we should be reading here. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That's the verse he's using there. These are the thrones in the heaven which John saw there after the door was opened. The twenty-four thrones circling about the central rainbow throne occupied by the jasper and sardine stone, the twenty-four elders and the four living ones. Revelations 4 and 3 and 4 and 6. An emblematic illustration of the promise to him that overcometh I will give to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sit with my father on his throne. So the quotations he's using there is Revelations 4 and 3. He that sat was to look upon like a sardine, a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And I think he speaks about verse 6 and before the throne there was a sea of glass like under crystal and in the midst of the throne around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind and also chapter 3 and verse 21 talking about the overcoming and sitting with him it says to over, him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. These thrones of the house of David belonging to Mount Zion are the thrones John refers to in chapter 20, verse 4. And he quotes that here. He says, I saw thrones, says he, they that sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them who had been beheaded on account of the testimony of Jesus and on account of the word of the deity, and who did no homage to the beast, nor to his image, and received not the sign upon their foreheads and upon their hands. These are the 144,000 on Mount Zion, 
who having been raised from among the dead and quickened and had judgment given to them, occupy thrones of judgment and thenceforth reign with Christ a thousand years. Among them are the twelve apostles, to whom the Lord Jesus in the days of his flesh promised a joint possession with himself of the thrones of the house of David. In answer to Peter, who said, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee, what therefore shall there be for us? Jesus replied, Ye who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit upon the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's taken from Matthew 19, verses 27 and 28. Among these also will be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets. And were these from the east, west, and north, and south, a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. All these stand before the throne and the Lamb as the glorified 144,000 clothed with white robes and when they rest from their labors with palms instead of a two-edged sword in their hands. So the location of the standing, he says, is to be literally the Mount Zion, Jerusalem, and the redeemed will be the resurrected and accepted believers who will then stand at and around that location rather than the teaching of apostate Christianity that the redeemed will be located in heaven where they will go after they die and, and after the rapture. <coughs> There's a couple quotations here that just supporting that last few statements he's brought out there. He's quoting from Luke 13, uh, verses 28 and 29. It says, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out, and they shall come from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And uh, Revelation 7 and 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, and uh, all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues stood before the throne, before the Lamb, both of white robes and palms in their hands. And finally, Psalm 149 and 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. So he's using that as a contrast to the, instead of the two-edged sword, there will be the, the palms in their hands, showing that there's a, a change in the, in, in the direction of, of their activities. So that's uh, quite a different uh, picture than you know what we were saying about the theories of the of those like the Jehovah's Witnesses who uh, say that you know there's a difference between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and, and the 144,000. This presents them as, as all together, all the same part of the same multitude. Pictures. I see. I've been told several times by some of the church growers that Zion is in heaven. Yeah, it's taken quite often as a symbol of, of heaven. And I guess you've got to pretty much use that if you're going to interpret these as a, you know, that make it conform, I guess, to that idea that you're in heaven. You'd have to interpret it that way because it's very obviously stated that this is the place where they will be and will be manifested. I'll get you next. Gordon? I was just going to say in regard to the, the literal and the figurative and the relationship uh, we understand these, this symbolic language but it, it is speaking of the literal events in the end, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the figure is somewhat the stage, it, it turns into a literal, I mean, it's not, symbolic doesn't turn into symbolic, it turns into literal, somewhat. Yeah, yeah in, in order for there to be a symbol, there has to be a, a literal that it is a symbol of. Yeah, yeah it's it's like the natural spirit, yeah. you can't have just a spiritual you yeah. got a sort of a natural mm -hmm. basis for it or it becomes natural right. 
point. Uh, David? Yeah, I was going to say that uh, the, the games feel that uh, Zion is on Earth. Mm-hmm. They do. They believe their Messiah is going to show up uh, there and uh, come in at the East Gate. And, uh, that's, uh, it's a long-standing belief and <coughs> The only difference, I guess, is the uh, who the Messiah is. You even got the artifacts from the original, well, not from the original temple, but recreated artifacts for the new temple that they're, they're mm-hmm. going to build, <laughs> worth millions of dollars in yeah. gold. And, yeah. It's interesting. Again, because that uh, picture back here of the, uh, where is it here? There, maybe on the other page. Yeah, this the central rainbow throne occupied by this jasper and sardine stone, the twenty-four elders, the four living ones. Um, you know, kind of, again, we look at this, and this is an artist's rendition of what it, what John might have seen. But it you know, uh, gives us some, some kind of a idea on the on the d- display of that vision. Okay, paragraph seven talks about the place, (coughs) purpose, and significance of the cherubim and seraphim. It says, The symbolic lamb and 144,000 on Mount Zion are Yahweh Tetzpeth, he who shall be hosts, of whom Isaiah prophesies in chapter 6. I saw, said he, Adonai, the spirit and plural manifestation, our Lord's, sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his robe skirts filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. And one cried to another and said, Holy, 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 Yahweh Tzvayah, the whole earth is full of his glory. Adonai with robe skirts filling the temple is the spirit as the lamb and the 144,000. These thousands are the skirts of the investing robe of the king, Yahweh Tzvayat, and symbolized by the six-winged seraphim, or four living ones full of eyes, described by John. I'm just going to go through this paragraph. We'll come back to the quotations later, because I think it's good just to keep the connection going here. It says that Adonai is one in plural manifestation. It appears from the eighth verse, the eighth verse here of, of Isaiah, chapter 6, I heard, said Isaiah, the voice of Adonai, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? In other words, Whom shall I, the Spirit, or the Father, send? Who will go for us? The plurality symbolized by the seraph skirts of the investing glory, or the investing robe. The Spirit of Christ and the prophet answers, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. In the ninth and tenth verses is the message to be delivered to Israel. The delivery is noted in Matthew 13, verses 13 to 15, and the messenger is there found to be Jesus. He came and was slain. He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Unto him then, the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests for the deity and his father to him be glory and dominion for the aeons of the aeons. Amen. Revelations 1 verses 5 and 6. This is the ascription of Isaiah's seraphim of Ezekiel's cherubim and of John's four living ones and therefore of the 144,000 to the Lamb for what he has done for them. The question, who will go for us, has been graciously responded to by the loving self-sacrifice of Christ for the ungodly. Romans 5, verses 6 to 8. 
but for this voluntary and disinterested sacrifice. In other words, if it hadn't been for this voluntary and disinterested sacrifice, there would be no redemption. And therefore, no seraphic 144,000 hereafter on Mount Zion or anywhere else. But the redemption price has been paid. And all the seals will be thoroughly unloosed. As certainly as the Lamb was slain, so surely will he appear on Mount Zion with the 144,000 and the moon of the political firmament shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when he who shall be hosts, Yahweh Tisveyah, shall reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients glory. Isaiah 24 verse 23. So in, in summary, quite a long paragraph saying a lot, but in summary, the cherubim or seraphim are the fiery, glorious human conveyances of the glory of Yahweh as they go forth in national and international conversion and divine judgment immediately prior to and in preparation of the beginning of the millennial age. It's kind of interesting going back to that Isaiah 6. Uh, Sid had that in his uh, study here not too long ago on Wednesday night when we were looking at that um, seraphim. Uh, there's quite a bit there. I think the, some of these names uh, of uh, these divine names we should probably look into here. This uh, Yahweh. This is, uh, Yahweh is right here. Oops, that's not working too good, is it? Try this one. There we go. Yehovah, um, a variation of uh, 3068 Yehovah, used after uh, definition in Hebrew 136 and pronounced by Jews as uh, H430, in other words, as um, Elohim, in order to prevent the repetition of the same sound, since they elsewhere pronounce these as uh, H136, God. And this is actually Sebaha. If we were to pronounce it the way the Hebrew pronounces it, it should be Sebaha. And it means a mass of persons, especially, regular, or especially regularly organized for war, an army, by implication a campaign, literally or figuratively, um, specifically hardship, worship. And uh, then you have the colon and the little dash here means that this is the way it's uh, translated in the, in the King James Version. It's translated by appointed time, um, army, battle, company, host, service, soldiers, waiting on war or warfare. That's the way the words, the words it's used to translate it. That is the memorial name. In other words, you see there the the idea again of, of multitude, of, of multiplicity. Other armies? Yeah. Yahavata Sabaha, I guess is how they would pronounce it in the Yahava Sabaha. And then Adonai. There's the, the one that said, you know, remember in the other version said pronounces 136, and that is how the Jews have pronounced uh, Yahweh or Yahweh. And they, uh, we pronounce as Adonai, it's really Haya or Hava. So you can see how the, the, the way it should be pronounced is really very, very close to Yahweh. Are you, are you, uh, Yehovah, Hava, the same kind of sounds. Supposed to mean probably to breathe, to be in the sense of existence. And it's uh, translated as be and, and have. Yeah.
and seraphim. These are identical with cherubim. This is a, an article from the uh, Christadelphian back in, uh, I just forget the, it was in the 1800s anyway. In Isaiah 6 and 2, these cherubic symbols are styled seraphim. I saw the Adonai said, He sit upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Seraph stood near to it, and one cried to another and said, Holy, 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 Yahweh Tzveyah, he, he who shall be hosts, the whole earth shall be full of his glory. There is no obscurity about the etymology of seraph. It signifies burning, fiery, de- deadly. The fiery serpent sent among the people, Numbers 21 and 6, which we read not too long ago, are styled by Moses seraphim. <coughs> by the saints, the seraphim and cherubim of Messiah's throne, the whole earth is to be filled with his glory. Being incarnations of spirit, they will be more than a match for all the powers of the world. <coughs> they will cast down their thrones, overthrow Babylon, waste the land of Assyria, reap the harvest of the earth, tread the winepress of wrath, and as a stream of devouring fire, destroy the body of Yahweh of Daniel's fourth polity with their burning flame. <coughs> So that's kind of the likeness there of the word and how you know it was used in terms of the, the fiery serpents and in various places through scripture and that's the application that uh, Brother Roberts gave to it. Word. Uh, just a question there on that. Each one has six wings. Excuse <coughs> me, what's the significance of that? Six is the number of man. Mm-hmm. Is that Glorified man's kind of thing. I think it's, yeah, I think it's <coughs> to do with the, the human element of it. There's, there's differences depending on the time period or the manifestation, you know, and, and the, the object of their existence at the particular time in which they're referenced to. If you wanted to go through a whole study of it, it would give you the, pretty much the whole purpose of God from beginning to end and how they played and figured into that. Uh, you'd find it in uh, Phanerosis. Yeah, to, to, yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> Brother Jones is written here, or marked here, where he speaks, but for this voluntary and disinterested sacrifice, why disinterested? I think if there's there was um, I'll, I'll leave, put that up for that's part of the that's a quote from the paragraph right yeah yeah I'd say that means lack of self interest uh, that's what I was going to suggest self interest mm-hmm. lack of self interest speaking of Christ yeah yes. see there's there's nothing really about although he he personally required it, but he required it as a representative.